Thank you, Dr. Smith. It is indeed a pleasure to be here this afternoon. I'd like to begin by thanking Mr. Ron Wilson of the Office of Social Equity and Dr. Kathleen Daly of the Center for Faculty Excellence here at Edinburgh for the opportunity to share with you some of my thoughts this afternoon about the use of force by police in relation to minority communities. I will do so primarily using the 2014 shooting of 12-year-old 12, 12 Tamir Elijah Rice by two Cleveland, Ohio police officers. The issue of race and race relations in this country, particularly in regards to policing and order maintenance, is something I've spent considerable time thinking about. And these aren't just musings but hard, often disconcerting thought with questions towards myself as well as the greater society and not always liking what I see. I've thought about race and social structure in this country and how this country is evolving. And I'm not saying this because it's what people would expect me to say or some social desirability nonsense. It is the truth. What I plan on doing is speaking for about 40 minutes or so and then open this up to the floor for discussion. However, we will need to frame this discussion because it can go a lot of different places as to what role police have played in race relations and what role they should play. I'm sure each one of us has opinions about this, but what we don't need are more opinions. What we need are conclusions, and there is a marked difference between the two. I do need to mention at this time much of what I say is taken from my own conclusions and conjecture. No one else is responsible for my presentation. Some of what I say here may not be palatable with you or some, but I alone am responsible for it. There may be some thoughts I share that make you uncomfortable. Once again, I am solely responsible for that also. I am not excusing conduct on anyone's part, nor am I a police apologist. And I'm standing here before you with the best of intentions. But we all know what the path to hell is paved with. When I was in the sixth grade, I had a lovely teacher, Mrs. Mitchell. She was good-hearted, but strict. And she introduced me to the great H.G. Wells. In order to get out of detention, a whipping from the principal, and other various punishments, she handed me a copy of the time machine and told me I had two days to write a book report, a good one, or my father would possibly find out about my idea to put gravel in the sheriff's car's hubcaps. That come to Jesus meeting with him would not have been one I looked forward to. But I've never forgotten this book and have reread it many times over the past 40 years. Wells was a brilliant writer, but his was the depiction of the flawed social structure of the Eloy and the Morlocks that I've always remembered. The protagonist of the time machine, known as the Traveler, went forward in time to the year AD 802-701, where he encountered the Eloy. They lived sumptuous lifestyles with every comfort imaginable. But over time, they'd gotten weak. They'd gotten soft. They'd gotten complacent. And they felt entitled, simply because that's what they thought had always been. They had no need to struggle. Living below, though, below the crumbling existence of Eloy, were the Morlocks. They ran the machinery that kept society going. They were largely out of sight, out of mind, and would only rise to the surface when one would occasionally snatch an Eloy for food. They were growing more and more discontent with their lot, and Eloy simply believed they were superior and entitled to their position. This attitude would haunt them. I've always found there was an evident Marxist theme, that of class struggle, running through this work. I'm no great fan of Marx, but I don't discount all of his contentions. History, much of it, is fueled by class struggle and the agents representing those classes. We are the inheritors of the next chapter of this struggle. 
The past two years especially, we have not seen what I believe are more instances of police violence towards minorities. I believe they are becoming more evident because they are more re better reported by police departments and by media coverage. You look at the statistics and for the last 20 years, there has not been an exponential growth. These have been exposed by a media that is increasingly critical and the advent of social media along with the reliance of people on social media to fuel both their political and social attitudes and that horrifies me. In short, they are indeed more evident. There have been instances though of what crime historian and theorist Samuel Walker would refer to as, because of their notoriety, the celebrated cases, and you see those at the top layer of his wedding cake model of criminal justice. And some of the more notable instances and the ones that have caught our attention, and I will read the brief list, it is certainly not all encompassing. Eric Garner, July 2014, New York City. Michael Brown, August 2014, Ferguson, Missouri. Laquan McDonald, October 2014, Chicago. Walter Scott, April 2015, North Charleston, South Carolina. Freddie Gray, April the 15th, Baltimore. Sandra Bland, July 2015, Texas. Alton Sterling, July 2016, Baton Rouge, Orlando Castle, July 2016, Minnesota. Connecting each of these cases, regardless of the particular circumstances, there are two commonalities. <coughs> One is that an African American died and the police were perceived as overstepping their authority, their responsibility, and the Constitution. Closer to home and to this area was another incident that added fuel to the fire of police distrust. The November 22, 2014 death of 12-year-old Tamir Rice by Cleveland, Ohio police officers. The death of this boy would have been concern enough for a racially mixed community. However, this came after another, to me even more egregious, incidents of a police shooting. November 29th, 2012, a Cleveland patrol officer mistook a car's backfiring for gunshots. Officers gave chase and speeds during the pursuit wavered between 20 miles an hour to 110. The driver of the pursued car was Timothy Russell, Melissa Williams. Russell is on the lower left, Williams in the center. The chase at times involved 62 cruisers and 104 officers in total before it ended in an East Cleveland schoolyard. Officers were never able to determine why Russell did not initially stop. Some think it is because both he and Williams had criminal records. You're going to see this theme, a recurrent theme. But had no outstanding warrants at the time. The chase ended when Russell pulled in the parking lot of Heritage Middle School in East Cleveland. Officers, some officers later stated, they believed they saw the suspect draw a gun. And that Russell gunned the car and they believed he was preparing to run them over. One unidentified officer opened fire. This was followed by others. The amount of gunfire exchange led some officers to believe that they were indeed being fired upon. This led to more gunfire. Thirteen officers at that scene fired 137 shots at that vehicle. Officer Michael Brelo, which you see on the right, fired 49 of those shots, and eventually at the close, jumped on the hood of the car and fired 15 more times at Russell, who was sitting behind the passenger wheel, or driver's wheel, excuse me. 
Russell was struck 23 times, Williams 24 times. No weapon was found in the vehicle. Both Russell and Williams lived in shelters at the time. It was not a Medal of Honor shooting. Brelo was initially charged with two counts of voluntary manslaughter. He was later acquitted. And all six officers were fired and others were disciplined or demoted. The families of Williams and Russell filed a lawsuit against the city of Cleveland. Cleveland shortly paid $3 million in a settlement to the two families and this was split evenly. There were some protests in the wake of this. Most were relatively peaceful. However, on May the 25th, 2014, two days after Brelo was acquitted, tempers flared among protesters. 71 people were charged with felonious assault, rioting, and failure to disperse. Fifteen of these were taken into custody by riot police. This shooting helped lay a groundwork of further distrust, skepticism, and outright hostility by African American members of the greater Cleveland community and throughout Cuyahoga County. This was a setting, I think referring to it as a spiritual setting is appropriate, surrounding Tamir Rice's shooting some two years later. Let me talk about police for a moment, in general. In academies, recruits are trained and it is constantly reinforced throughout their career that if they make a shoot decision instead of a not shoot one, that their reputation is on the line, not to mention their career. They are responsible professionally, ethically, morally, civically, maybe financially, and perhaps criminally. In short, they personally own every bullet. The training is intense as it should be. According to studies sponsored by the International Association of Chiefs of Police, an officer has approximately 0.8 seconds to make the shoot, no shoot decision. That's all the time they've got. This is quick, it is fluid. And this is from the time the suspect goes for their sidearm. An officer is trained to put down the assailant, to kill them. The rationale is if they are not put down, they can take out the officer or another citizen. It is that simple and that complex. April the 7th, 2015, Officer Jesse Kidder of the Richmond, Ohio Police Department responded to a call regarding a suspected murderer. Kidder was wearing a body camera at the time. Footage later showed Kidder confronting the suspect. Kidder had his gun drawn. Suspect still refuses to surrender. Kidder keeps giving him chances. I don't want to shoot you, man. I don't want to shoot you. He says over and over. The suspect eventually yells, shoot me, and he rushes Kidder. An obvious attempt at suicide by cop. Kidder backpedals, stumbles, and falls, but he doesn't return fire. The suspect gives up when a second officer responds. Kidder was credited by many for his restraint. Some call it heroic. Among many police, though, probably the majority of police, there was a different perspective. The suspect, not the officer, was in control of the situation. In addition, a shot officer cannot protect the community. The term is deadly hesitation. The police don't like this action setting a possible precedent. They believe society, the courts, and the justice system in general is reinforcing the notion officers should refrain from using deadly force when justified, and I don't entirely disagree with that. Let me pause for a moment and give you my personal perspective. I've been teaching a little over 20 years. In that time, I bet you I've trained at least a thousand students that have gone on to careers in law enforcement, and I'm proud of all of them. I can only think of that time, maybe three or four, that to me were questionable, and those were weeded out during the psych evaluation. 
I lost one boy, Justin Weinbrenner, a couple of years ago. He was an Akron, Ohio police officer. He was a fine boy. I appreciate the stress they are under, better than you know. But there is oversight, and need, sometimes it is needed. All right, this is a scene just prior to Rice's shooting. It is at a park near the Cudell, Cudell well, on the property of Cudell Recreational Center, Cleveland, Ohio. A 911 caller reported a black male at the Cudell Recreation Center was sitting on a park swing and pointing a gun at others in the park. At the beginning of the call and in the middle of it, he says the pistol is probably fake. You can find, you can listen to this 911 call, it's all over YouTube. The caller also believed the wielder of the gun was probably a juvenile. Two officers of the Cleveland Police Department, Timothy Lohman and Frank Garmback, were dispatched. They responded to the call, but this information was not initially passed on to them. Upon arriving at the scene, Lohman said he later saw a black gun on a picnic table. I'm hoping I can get this to work for you all. Yeah. All right, there's audio with it. It's not working, but you don't really need it. I hate these advertisements. You're interrupting my video like I'm ever gonna buy anything from you all. All right, you will see there is an unidentified citizen sitting on the picnic table. Tamir keeps wandering around the sidewalk. That blurred out figure that is following them is another person they did not want to identify. He's walking around. Now you'll see him. He's got something in that right hand. We can't make it out. You never could. He keeps walking, keeps walking. I think it's right about here. Always biting his nails. But he doesn't have a gun out. Now this surveillance video taken across, uh, taken, it was across the street from the park. It's approximately 30 minutes in length. This has been cut down to less than two minutes. So bear with me. Wanders in and out of camera range. All right, this is a clip you just saw or barely made out. Is it possible to get the lights dimmed here a little bit in the front? I'm sorry to bother y'all, I just want folks to be able to see this. Thank you very much, that helps a lot, Ron, thank you. Yes, sir, thank you very much. All right, here we go. Pay attention, it's gonna happen really quick. Video's gonna cut off and it's gonna show Tamir alone under the gazebo. Here we go. There's Tamir. There's a patrol car driven by Garnback. That's the shot right there. You see how quick that happened? That's real time. We'll go back to that shortly. Lohman stated he saw, that he saw Rice pick up the gun and put it in his waistband. Lohman later stated he shouted from the car three times for him to put up his hands. Rice then reached into his waistband, according to Lohman, and pulled out the gun. At this point, Lohman fired two shots, hitting Rice in the torso. Rice died the next day of his wounds. In its entirety, the incident happened in under two seconds. Tamir Rice was five feet, seven inches in height and weighed 195 pounds. Hmm. 
There we go. Rice didn't have a gun. He had an airsoft pistol. That's what the young man had. Now, look at that pistol. It is a model of Colt 40, based on and a replica of a Colt 45 M1911 semi-automatic. Does it look real? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now this one did not have the orange tip a lot of them come with that people say folks can identify it as a non-lethal weapon. I don't buy that entirely because I don't know whether it's responsible for an officer to be able to determine that in under 0.8 seconds. You're seeing the gun. But Tamir's gun lacked that orange tip. The surveillance video showed Rice pacing around the park, you saw that, extending his right arm, you saw that. A gun could not be seen. But the videos, you can tell, is too grainy to make any precise determination. Guys, I need to back up a little bit. My old eyes can't handle this. I haven't had mood lighting since my wife and I were dating. <laughs> Thank you, right there. Let's go with that. The patrol car is moving at high speed across the park lawn and stops abruptly by the park gazebo. You saw that. And that car was actually slowing down. It was going much faster across the yard. Lowman is shown immediately exiting the vehicle and opens fire hitting rise from a distance of less than 10 feet. The car is still slightly in motion, but slow enough for Lohman to exit it safely. It appears that about the time Lohman exited the car that Rice did reach into his waistband. Up to this point, Lohman had still some slight degree of justification as his decision to open fire. The size of the suspect could not absolutely identify him as a juvenile. He was a big kid for 12. He really was, stocky. 195 pounds on a 5'7 frame. Also, a gun in the hands of a juvenile, even if he was known by responding officers absolutely to be a juvenile, which they did not know and cannot assume, can be just as deadly as in the hands of an adult. Further supporting the officer's action was that the airsoft gun, you saw how real it looks. They are made to the exact specifications to the revolvers or semi-automatics on which they're modeled. They look real, size, shape, color. Go to any Dick sporting goods store and you can examine them for yourselves. It was after the shooting that the actions of the officers, the Cuyahoga County Justice System, and the media were, in my opinion, totally and completely reprehensible. First, you won't see it in this video, but you see it in an extended one. Four minutes passed before Rice got any first aid. The officer stood there and looked. They didn't do much after that. Four minutes later, another officer arrived on the scene along with an FBI agent and treatment was administered. Eight minutes later, paramedics arrived. Eight minutes later, they began to transport Rice to the Metro Health Medical Center. The 9-11 dispatcher was criticized for not passing along that the gun was possibly fake and the suspect perhaps juvenile. They believed this could have made a difference in how officers responded. However, police have to act on what they see more often than what they're told. Samaria Rice, Tamir Rice's mother, when interviewed by police, said the airsoft gun was given to him shortly before that by a friend. The surveillance video of the park led prosecutors to believe Rice may have had possession of this for at least a half an hour in advance of the shooting. Mrs. Rice was acting on what she had been told. I did not know his fact. 
the media trashed her for this, or some of them did. It was seen as blatant lying on her part. And I find this unfair. I find it highly unfair. This was a mother who just lost her boy. There's an old adage, when you lose your husband, you're a widow. You lose your wife, you're a widower. You lose your parents, you're an orphan. There's no word to describe the loss of a child. And I know this. You cannot expect absolute certainty and a clear rationale by someone who just found out her son had been killed. Within two minutes of the shooting, Rice's 14-year-old sister came out of her apartment that she shared with the family and became hysterical. She rushed the scene, screaming at the officers. One of the officers restrained her. She started beating him with her fist. At this point, she was wrestled to the ground, placed in handcuffs, and put in the back of the car. Simply restraining would have been one thing, but this was something else entirely. Mary Rice later told investigators when informed of her son being shot that she too had become hysterical, crying and screaming. According to her, she was threatened with arrest. If she could not control herself, officers denied this, but neighbors of Rice corroborated her story, and I have to say I personally believe it because I've heard her tell the story in person. I've seen her on the news telling the story. Words vary, but the incident does not, not one bit. Within a week of the shooting, the Northeast Ohio Media Group published a story illustrating Rice's parents' criminal records. We call this blaming the victim. The days following Tamir Rice's shooting, information about the two officers came to light. It was dug out by MSNBC because this was a national story. It showed Timothy Lohman, particularly as a flawed hire by the Cleveland police. Lohman had joined the police department in March 2014. Prior to this, a few years earlier, he had served five months on the Independence Ohio Police Force. It is a suburb of Cleveland. Four of these months were spent at the academy, and he was in training at the police department for a month, not on the street yet. In the wake of the Rice shooting, the city of Independence released a letter written by then Chief Jim Pollock to the city human resources manager about Lohman. He explained Lohman had resigned rather than face certain termination. Pollock felt Lohman lacked the emotional stability needed to be a police officer. His handling of weapons was dismal and he was distracted due to relationship problems. His personnel file from Independence was never reviewed by the HR department, Cleveland Police. Early in 2014, Frank Garnbeck was accused of using excessive force by a female. He had put her in a chokehold, wrestled her to the ground. She claimed he began hitting her. That was never proven. But the city settled with this accuser for $100,000. Initially, after interviewing the two officers, Cleveland police attempted to find additional witnesses. Few were forthcoming. The Cuyahoga County Sheriff's Office took over the investigation into the conduct of the officers. Yet six months after they assumed this responsibility, neither of the two officers had been interviewed. Garmbach was not under criminal investigation at this time and would not be. On June 11th, Judge Ronald Adrian in response to a citizen petition, stated Lohman should be charged with the following crimes, most serious of which murder, followed by involuntary manslaughter, reckless homicide, negligent homicide, and dereliction of duty. I've read his letter. Adrian also maintained Garnbeck should be charged with negligent homicide and dereliction of duty. Ohio judges lacked the authority to issue arrest warrants in such cases. He forwarded his opinion to city prosecutors and the Cuyahoga County prosecutor, Timothy McGinty. Two days later, June 13th, McGinty released a 224-page 224, 224 report 
of the investigation. This was without any information given by either of the officers accused. Notable in the report, and one of the few critical things found in it was that witnesses did not hear Officer Lohman shout out three times for Rice to put up his hands. All right, this is an aside for me regarding this. I've timed it. I've timed it. You can hurriedly blurt out, put up your hands in under two seconds. I did it three times. My average time was 1.5. However, you cannot make out what I was saying. Saying it quickly but clearly took approximately 2.4 seconds. Now factor in the officers pulled on the scene quickly with Lohman immediately exiting the still moving vehicle and firing. He would have had to have hung out the window and yelled this some 50 yards away began to do it. I don't believe he ever said this. I think he lied. When he did that, he lost all credibility with me and with many others, and he did not have to say that. He did not have to say that to support the justification to fire. Lohman also claimed he saw Rice pick up a gun from a picnic table on the gazebo. From the speed in which the patrol car was traveling and over rough ground, I doubt if he could have seen this. And it's not evident in the video. McGinty on October 10th released two reports he had sought from outside experts. Both concluded the shooting was reasonable. It was assumed by some McGinty had cherry-picked experts to prove what he wanted to prove. In light of this criticism, he did convene a grand jury to determine if charges should be filed. Shortly after Christmas 2014, the prosecutor's office announced the grand jury had decided not to indict. McGinty stated in a prepared letter before media, given the perfect storm of human error, mistakes, and communications by all involved that day, that evidence does not indicate criminal conduct by police. Samaria so Rice immediately released a statement of her own through her attorney. Prosecutor McGinty deliberately sabotaged the case, never advocating for my son and acting instead like the police officer's defense attorney. December 5th, 2014, the Rice family filed a wrongful death suit against the city of Cleveland and the two officers. They accused the officers of acting recklessly and unreasonably and the city of Cleveland was criticized for not adequately training their officers and doing a thorough background check on Lohman. On April the 25th, 2016, the lawsuit was settled. The Rice family received $6 million. Now there are bad ideas, and there are bad ideas. One of the worst is what I'm going to describe to you right now. It probably ranks up there with Custer deciding to take on Sitting Bull. It really didn't work out for all involved. April the 25th fell on a Monday. At 10.30 that morning, the settlement was announced. By 2 o'clock, the Cleveland Police Patrolmen's Association, the local union, issued what I think is one of the most bizarre responses possible to that decision and to the Rice family. They went so far as to advise the Rice family on how to spend the money. The letter was addressed to media. And that alone, that was the only salutation, simply media. It was a brief letter. I'm going to read an excerpt of it. We can only hope the Rice family and their attorneys will use a portion of this settlement to help educate the youth of Cleveland in the dangers associated with the mishandling of real and facsimile firearms. Something positive must come from this tragic loss. That would be educating the youth of the dangers of possessing a real or replica firearm. We look forward to the possibility of working with the Rice family to achieve this common goal. And it was signed by the President of the Union. I will not utter it here in this forum, but if I'd been to Samaria Rice, I could have told them what they could have done with their advice. It lacks sensitivity, let alone cat class. All right, now for the prosecutor. I told you we'd come back to him. 
2015, a book that was all the rage was Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow. Perhaps the greatest contribution this book made to society at large was to inform the reader the most important player in the criminal justice system is the prosecutor. At one time, police had enormous discretion as to what they could do and not do as to the arrest, no arrest decision. That largely has been removed. Judges have to work with what they are given. It is the prosecutor who decides what to charge the defendant with and what penalty they recommend. McGinty told the grand jury that he recommended Lohman and Garnbeck not be indicted. He had publicly said on more than one occasion he would not aggressively second guess police officers. There have been arguments on both sides regarding McGinty's conduct, but there's no doubt he was engaging in what we recognize today as blaming the victim and the victim's family. McGinty referred to Lohman as a reasonable, seasoned officer. But considering his history, demonstrated history of mental illness he exhibited while in independence, few could have believed he would readily make a proper determination of what was reasonable conduct in a high stress situation. Many have commented on Tamir's size, so did McGinty. It is likely that Tamir's size made him look much older, this is McGinty talking, and who had been warned that his pellet gun might get him into trouble, either intended to hand it over to the officers or show them it was not a real gun. We will never know. From Rice's appearance and the appearance of the airsoft gun, McGinty's contention was that it would have been enough for a grand jury to believe the officers were justified. But there are some that believe the shooting was not completely unavoidable. If an officer comes across a situation where there is a risk of harm, the question has to be answered by them and quickly, how imminent is the threat? That controls the time you take to, to assess and what distance you need to put between yourself and the suspect. Garnback's decision to drive so close to Rice was at best probably a poor tactical decision. They need to get there quick but it was thought, in hindsight, by other police experts, that he should have stopped a little farther away, perhaps within 20 yards. There were no others in the gazebo when Rice was shot, so there was no immediate threat. There were some across the street, but they were about 50 yards away. And you didn't see them because they were roughly at the same vantage point the surveillance camera was. McGinney also still stated at one point that officers may have been thinking of other officers killed near Cadell Centers Park. The shootings he was referring to and the only ones that occurred in that neighborhood, which is one of the most high crime neighborhoods in Cleveland, dated back to 2006 and before that 1996. Lowman came on the force 2014 Garm back in 2008, neither was around when these shootings happened. And I doubt if they were in their minds, possible, but doubtful. The information that both of Tamir Rice's parents had criminal records was later informally released by an NBC reporter that had indeed come from the prosecutor's office. He certainly mentioned it publicly on more than one occasion. Before Tamir's birth in 2001, Samaria Rice pled guilty to an assault charge for which she received a six-month suspended sentence. That same year, his birth father, Leonard Warner, was convicted and sentenced to one year probation for attacking Rice with a knife, Samaria Rice. There were other instances of domestic violence <coughs> through the years with Rice being a victim and Warner a perpetrator. In 2013, less than a year before the shooting, Samaria Rice had pled guilty to drug trafficking. And what does this mean? Well, it means that the boy was not brought up by the Cosbys. The family was not perfect. But this in no way is a justification for what happened to him, nor does it explain it. This past February, I was present with Prosecutor McGinty 
debated his opponent at Suburban Temple in Beachwood, Ohio. His challenger for the Democratic primary was Michael O'Malley. O'Malley is a former councilman in Cleveland and a former prosecutor himself. Suburban Temple, a reformed Jewish congregation, was working that evening with the Greater Cleveland Congregations Association, composed of houses of faith that worked for racial understanding and social justice issues. To his credit, McGinty showed up. Many didn't think he would, and I thought it was even money that he wouldn't. The crowd was hostile and shouted him down, but he kept his composure. I'll give him that. McGinty lost the primary with only 44% of the vote, to Malley's 55%. In white majority districts, it was tight. McGinty took 50.6% of the vote with McMally, O'Malley behind him at 494 However, in predominantly African-American precincts, O'Malley won by some 70%. There were marches, there were rallies, but there was little violence, and media attention was soon drawn away. And by most, Tamir Rice was added to another other list, a list of other black boys who had met early deaths at the hands of police. The point I would like to make here is perception is reality. If you perceive something to be true, then to you it is, and it is accurate. And the perception that police can at the very least act unprofessional if not outright hostile to a minority community is not going to engender faith. I presented this case trying to take both sides into consideration. There were others, though, that did not blame white police officers, hyperbolic prosecutors, or a boy who made a bad decision. They blamed the president. They blamed Obama. It was easier. And I have to mention this. How many of y'all have heard people say that the issue of race has gotten exponentially worse since the election of Barack Obama? Yeah, I have too. And I'll tell you, early on I thought it. I believed it, but then I thought some more. 2008 election of Obama simply forced us to look at certain social, cultural, political, economic, and theological issues that have never adequately been addressed. They have been hidden. There are more variables, some obvious, some clouded, that have contributed to this. And I think the advent of a glo more global social media is certainly one of them. Of all the pathologies, though, that have been brought to the forefront, the American system of criminal justice was probably the one that garnered the most attention. And Obama has, since 2014, commented on these type of shootings. And there have been more than a few, including Tamir Rice's, and I'm no way, in no way negating the significance of these. However, in regards to Obama, what set the stage for his presidency's record on race, crime, and policing took place on July 30th, 2009. It was both well-intentioned and damning. It was a beer summit. July 2009, Harvard professor Henry Louis Gates Jr. had returned home to China to find his front door stuck. It looked later that it had been jimmied, somebody tried to break in. With the help of his driver, tried to force it open, wouldn't budge, went around to his back door. A neighbor who did not recognize Gates called the police about a possible robbery in progress. Gates entered his home through the back door. An officer responded, asked Gates to step outside for questioning, and the situation escalated from there. The officer said Gates became belligerent. Gates said that the officer became threatening and intimidated him. Both sides later, the officer and Gates met individually and privately. And they both recognized that they could have deflated the situation. But the president commented on this prefacing the remarks that he had not been on the scene and didn't know all the particulars, but went further to say, I don't know, not having been there, not seeing all the facts, what role race played in that. But I think it's fair to say, number one, any of us would be pretty angry. Number two, that the Cambridge police acted stupidly in arresting somebody when there's always already proof that they were in their own home, and that proof wasn't there. He was wrong about that one. Number three, what I think we know separate and apart from this incident is that there's a long history in this country 
of African Americans, Latinos, being stopped and investigated by law enforcement disproportionately. That's just a fact. Whites expected Obama to be above race and represent all collectively and fairly. These remarks did not to them reflect that. Certain leaders in the black community criticized him for not being more firm and vituperative. Before this, his approval rating among whites had been at 54 percent. It immediately dropped to 40 percent. Throughout all of this, the cross of race has been laid upon Barack Obama's shoulders, and he has spent much of his last eight years negotiating the path of his particular Via Dolorosa. It's unfair, grossly unfair, to lay this responsibility on one man. The Reverend Endicott Peabody, the founder of Groton School, would frequently say to his students that the arc of civilization is ever upward. I believe that. I have to believe that. But where we have failed as a people is to take individual responsibility. Tamir Rice's death was tragic beyond question. We do not know, given time and maturity, the man he would have turned out to be. In closing, all I can say is that Tamir Rice was a boy who made a mistake. He should have not have taken that facsimile gun to that park. It was a foolish thing to do. But you know what? Twelve-year-old boys do damn fool things all the time. I know this. I was one and I've raised one. Tamir Rice did not wake up that day, November 2nd, 2014, and think it would be his last day on earth. He could not have conceived of himself as a martyr. Being that age, he probably didn't understand the meaning of the word. But at 3.30 that afternoon, he became one to many, another one on a long list. The question I will leave you with, and there are two, is what do we expect of police? It is a horrible job at times, what people expect and what reality is. The second is do you think police would have acted so aggressively if he were white? I have my suspicions, I have my opinions, but I don't have conclusions, I don't have that information, and we'll never get it. I simply cannot give you an answer to that. I thank you for your time and kind attention. <laughs>